Today we're going to be looking at the fall feast prophecies. There are seven feasts of the Lord that God gave to Israel. Actually, he entrusted these feasts to Israel. He didn't like give them to Israel and then no to nobody else. The fall feasts, just like the spring feasts, are prophetic. And what they do is they rehearse God's redemptive plan. Christianity as we know it pretty much sprung from Catholicism, and so we don't really do the Feasts of the Lord. In fact, we don't know very much about the Feasts of the Lord, what we call the Jewish Feast Days. They're not really Jewish at all. They are actually prophetic of God's plan of redemption. But because we're familiar with Christmas and Easter and those kinds of holidays, and we don't know very much about the feasts of the Lord, what Christians tend to do then is like type into Google or whatever, uh, the feasts of the Lord and uh, or the Jewish feasts or Hebrew feast days. And what we end up with is the Jewish version of Catholicism. We end up with the traditions of men. So one of the things that's super important is that when we read about the Feast of the Lord, that we don't import Jewish tradition. We just need to read the Feast of the Lord for what they are in the Bible and not import any other kind of Jewish tradition because we're going to end up going in places that the Bible doesn't go. I have a two-page handout for you and I'm going to just zoom through this today and I'm not going to give supporting verses or anything like that because I've talked about this stuff so many times in so many videos and gone into great detail. So what I hope to do in this video is just do a survey of the Feasts of the Lord and explain how God uses them prophetically, how he's used them in the past, how he's using them in the present, and how he's going to be using the feast during the end times. And then we're going to make some forecasts about things that may be showing up in our very near future. So the predictions that I'm making are not because I'm a prophet, because I'm not, and are not because I have some special inside information. What I'm doing is looking at the Word of God. I'm seeing the prophetic pattern. So I'm kind of a weatherman. <laughs> I'm prognosticating, but I can't guarantee anything. I'm just showing you what I see and the pattern of prediction that I see in these fall uh, feasts and the prophecies that are sort of bundled up or incorporated into these feasts. So the first point I want to make is that the feast days are not Jewish. Okay, The seven feasts of the Lord were entrusted to the Jews uh, just like the rest of the Bible was entrusted to them. They are part of scripture and the feasts are prophetic in nature and they rehearse the plan of redemption. So the second point I want to make is something I've just said. Do not incorporate current or past Jewish or Hebrew traditions. They are not part of the prophecy. So a lot of people will say, oh, the Jews say that the Feast of Trumpets is the day that no man knows the day or the hour. Please don't do that because that's tradition. It's not in the Word of God. So we're not going to take Hebrew tradition and insert it into God's Word. So we're to treat the feast days and what we read about them as any other scripture in the Bible. And the third point is this, that every feast provides some aspect of God's great plan of redemption. God's plan of redemption includes a lot of things, including uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, the giving of the Holy Spirit, bringing people into heaven uh, through the harvest imagery. This is all part of God's plan of redemption. It's a big plan that has a lot of parts to it. And so every feast day is going to be prophetic of, of some aspect of God's plan of redemption. Number four, God's plan of redemption includes both the first coming and the second coming of Christ. The feast days tell us what is happening, who it's happening to, 
and for what reason. And the feasts also provide the when. They provide the when. That is, certain aspects of the redemptive plan are going to happen on certain feast days. For example, Jesus died during Passover. He was the perfect, sinless Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. He died on Passover. Could Jesus have died on another day and his death have atoned for the sins of the world? Well, yes, but the plan is that people would know when that was happening, that Jesus himself would know when that was happening, and that the timing of that is tied in with the timing of certain feasts of the Lord. Which leads us to number six. There's no reason why God would stop using the feasts as prophecy. There's no reason to believe that the pattern would be discontinued after Christ died and rose from the dead. In fact, we know that the pattern did continue at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles, the 120, uh, 3,000 new believers on the actual day of Pentecost. So there's no reason why God would stop using the feast days to tell us about the plan of redemption. We can expect that the prophetic aspect of the feast days, including timing, will apply also to the second coming of Christ. So I've done videos on the 70th week of Daniel and what we understand is that Christ fulfilled the first three and a half years of that 70th week at his first coming, and we're dealing with uh, sabbatical years, the Shemitah, seven years, and then seven groups of seven years, which bring us to a jubilee. So the 70th week of Daniel is that last seven years before the 10th jubilee will happen, at his second coming. So the first half of Daniel's 70th week is all about his first coming, which began on the Feast of Trumpets when John the Baptist showed up. Three and a half years later, he died on Passover. Then Jesus ascended into heaven and he gave the Holy Spirit. And now we've been living in this space of time that's commonly referred to as the church age. The abomination of desolation is going to take place sometime in the future, and it is the start point for the second half of Daniel's 70th week. I have done so many videos on the 70th week of Daniel. Please check the playlist, especially the newer videos, and you'll see that the 70th week of Daniel is broken into two parts, the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And we know that because the 70th week of Daniel is going to end at the start of a jubilee year, and we know that a jubilee year will not begin on a Feast of Trumpets. We know that it begins on the Day of Atonement. So we know that Christ is going to finish out that 70th week of Daniel on the Day of Atonement. This is another reason why we know that the feast days are still in play. They're still prophetic and they're still going to give us timing for when things happen. So the fall feasts are the Feast of Trumpets, which begins on the first day at the sighting of the new moon, the first day of the seventh Hebrew month, which corresponds with September, October of our year, but it's the seventh Hebrew month. And the Feast of Trumpets lasts uh, two days, and it's also called Yom Teruah, which means the day of shouting. And that's actually a more accurate term for this feast day. And we'll see in a few minutes how the day of shouting is really a better uh, way to think about this feast than the Feast of Trumpets, because the word trumpet isn't even used in the name for that feast day. The second fall feast is the Day of Atonement, which is a 25-hour feast, and it begins on the uh, just before sundown on the 9th of Tishri, the 9th day of the 7th month, and lasts through the 10th day, um, just past sundown on the 10th day. Of Tishri. It's a one-day feast, but it's kind of a long day. It's not 24 hours, it's 25 hours long. 
The third feast that we find in the seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is a seven day feast that actually has another feast that's sort of connected with the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's called the eighth day. So that's sort of the name of that eighth day of um, Tabernacles. It's not actually a part of Tabernacles, but it's connected to it. The Feast of Tabernacles begins on the 15th day of the month, which is the full moon, and then goes for seven days. And then the eighth day, of course, is on the eighth day. I'm going to explain prophetically what these feasts are mean. And one of the things you just got to get out of your head is the idea that Jesus fulfilled every feast, that he filled them, fulfilled them in linear order, that um, that once he fulfilled a feast, it was one and done. And that is a very Greek and Western way of thinking, but it is not Hebraic. The Hebrew way of viewing the feasts is that they they cycle around. So because there's so many aspects to each of the feasts, it may take more than one feast day to actually fulfill every aspect of a feast. And this is particularly true with the Day of Atonement. We're going to see this with the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. We're going to even see that with the Feast of Tabernacles, multiple fulfillments of these feasts. I've done many videos on this in the past. So we're not looking for Jesus to fulfill every spring feast in order and then every fall feast in order. In fact, Jesus has already fulfilled certain aspects of the fall feasts at his first coming. That's some of the stuff that we're going to look at right now. So the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Shouting, has actually been fulfilled in certain ways at Jesus' first coming. So the star of Bethlehem actually appeared over the Feast of Trumpets. It was the heavens declaring that the Messiah had been born and the wise men in the east saw the star. They saw it and they followed it until they came to the place where baby Jesus was. We know that John the Baptist appeared over the Feast of Trumpets. And when people asked him who he was, because people were in expectation that the Messiah would come, they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am the voice of one Teruahing in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. So he was that voice that was shouting in the wilderness, uh, prepare the way of the Lord one aspect of the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Right now, in our lifetimes, we've seen another fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, and that was the Revelation 12 sign that appeared in the starry heavens. It appeared at the climax of that second day of the Feast of Trumpets. So there is a future fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, too. I hope you can see how this same feast can be fulfilled multiple times, giving people a wake up that God is about to do something in his redemptive plan. In the future, I think we'll be able to see the appearance of the two witnesses on a future Feast of Trumpets because their role is very similar to John the Baptist and he manifested to Israel over the Feast of Trumpets. He actually had a ministry that preceded the Feast of Trumpets, but he didn't show up to Israel until the Feast of Trumpets. It's very possible that that will be repeated again with the two witnesses. It's very possible that we may also see uh, the travail of the woman that is a war in Israel that begins on a future Feast of Trumpets, perhaps even this year, 2023. The next feast is the Day of Atonement, and this is a feast that as I've um, researched all of this stuff over the years, I have come to understand that this feast tells the story of Jesus' ministry. Okay, This is the story of Jesus' ministry and all the various aspects of his ministry. If you look at the ritual that's associated with the Day of Atonement, with the two goats and the one being slain and the one going into the wilderness and the high priest going in and out of the uh, Holy of Holies where God's presence was meeting with the high priest over the ark and the incense and all of that. 
There's so many symbols in the Day of Atonement ritual, and every one of those symbols has to be fulfilled in some way. And this feast is one of the most interesting feasts, and I've done many videos on the Day of Atonement and how Christ has fulfilled the various aspects of the Day of Atonement. I'm just going to touch on them in this video. At Jesus' first coming, he was baptized on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is when God meets with man. And that's when the heavens opened, the dove descended, God's voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This happened on Jesus' baptism. Jesus died on that day. That is, he died to himself in the waters of baptism. Okay, and he rose as the last Adam. He identified with us. This is when Jesus stopped living his own life for himself. And this is when he became one of us and was living as the second Adam, as our representative man. He was the goat who was slain. Then there's a goat that is taken into the wilderness. And immediately after Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, that's when the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And of course, that's all part of the Day of Atonement ritual when that goat goes out to Azazel. Three years after Jesus was baptized, there was another fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, but it was actually a vision or a prophecy. It really happened. Uh, the disciples were there. It was something that really happened. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said to his disciples, don't tell anybody the vision until after I've risen from the dead. Okay, so this was a, a, an experience that Jesus had with three of his disciples on the mountain of transfiguration when again the voice of God was there with Moses and Elijah and the voice of God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we went from Jesus being the lowliest of men uh, in the waters of baptism identifying with us to being the victorious man who was going to be um, God's heir. <laughs> okay, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, he is God's representative. So uh, Jesus' face became glowing. His cl clothes were as white as light. And that Moses and Elijah appeared. And this is a prophetic vision of the end times. So there is going to be a day of atonement when Jesus and the two witnesses show up on that day. There is a present aspect of the day of atonement that's taking place right now where Jesus as our high priest is in the Holy of Holies. He went behind the veil to intercede for believers. During Jesus' second coming, I think that he may appear, along with the two witnesses, in the newly erected temple, which is not going to be on the Temple Mount because it's not that kind of temple. It's the Tabernacle of David. And remember, every earthly temple reflects whatever's going on in the heavenly temple at that time. The heavenly temple in Revelation are kings and priests, seated in God's presence. And that is exactly what the tabernacle of David is all about. And it's just a tent with the Ark of the Covenant with a golden altar of incense. So during the last days, Jesus and the two witnesses may possibly be present on the Day of Atonement in that tabernacle of David. What's interesting to me that one of my subscribers uh, brought up in an email is that this year in 2023 this will be the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War that took place in 1973. So it's possible that this war will take place, the war that we're expecting in Israel may take place on Yom Kippur. So this is just something we're going to keep a watch on and uh, in any case if this is the year of our rapture, what that means then is that the two witnesses will actually show up before we are out of here on, on the Feast of Tabernacles. So uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. Daniel chapter 9, 27, the 70th week of Daniel. 
ends in the 10th jubilee of the 70 Shemitah years uh, that we get in Daniel chapter 9, and that will be on the Day of Atonement. So Christ will return on the Day of Atonement. It will be 1,260 days after the abomination of desolation. And if you want to work end time events and find out when they take place, you start at the end of Jesus' return on the Day of Atonement. You count back um, 1,260 days and you'll know exactly when the abomination of desolation will take place. And you can just use that date then and find out when these other things are going to happen uh, that we read about in the book of Revelation. And I've done extensive study in this, and I have a timeline spreadsheet for you. The link for that is in the description box. On the day that Jesus returns, on the Day of Atonement, He's going to take the beast, the false prophet, those who've been made into the image of the beast, those who've taken the mark of the beast and throw them into the lake of fire. And Satan will be bound and placed in the pit. This is going to be Jesus' great reset. Okay, And that's what Jubilee is all about. It's about a reset when the prisoners are set free, when the land returns back to its original owner. And of course, during the year of Jubilee, Jesus will get his world back. All right, so let's go on to the Feast of Tabernacles and the eighth day. The Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day feast that has this eighth day at the end, and it is a feast of joy, and they were commanded <laughs> to have a good time. So at the first coming of Christ, the Feast of Tabernacles was fulfilled partially at Jesus' birth. He was born, most likely, on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles and circumcised, named, redeemed, all of that on the eighth day. And remember, this is a feast of joy. The Bible tells us that when a woman is in labor, she has sorrow, but when she sees she's given birth to a man child, she has great joy. In John chapter 7, we read about Jesus showing up at a Feast of Tabernacles. And it's uh, toward, uh, I think, verse 38 or 39 that Jesus talks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we see that actually connected with the great day of the feast, with this Feast of Tabernacles. And I think it's prophetic of a future outpouring of the Spirit of God on a Feast of Tabernacles. The present day fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is... It's symbolic of our joy that we have when we live our lo a life in the Spirit, even though we're living in um, temporary homes. Remember, the Jews were told to make a booths, uh, tent, little tents out of branches, uh, beautiful trees, and that they did that on the first day. And then by the time the eighth day rolled around, those uh, sukkahs that they had built were starting to look a little wealthy and a little old. And on the eighth day, that's when they went to their real home, their permanent home. These bodies are called tents, according to Paul, and they are going to be destroyed. And one day we'll get a permanent home that is given to us by God. Whenever we see seven days, whether it's the seven days of unleavened bread or the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, what we're looking at is the course of somebody's life. The seven days a week represents someone's life. So our life in the Spirit is one of joy as we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay, during the second coming, the Feast of Tabernacles is going to have um, several fulfillments again, okay, because the feasts cycle around. It's not one and done. And it's not just Jesus that fulfills the feast. It's the, it's the plan of redemption. So there is um, multiple people who are involved in the various feasts. It's not just solely about Jesus. The Day of Atonement is Jesus' feast day, though, and he is the only one who can fulfill that feast day. But when it comes to some of these harvest festivals, um, like the uh, Feast of First Fruits or Pentecost, and here, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, we're going to see multiple people, different groups of people, who are part of the fulfillment of the prophecy. The first hidden <laughs> fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is the birth of the male child, which is uh, 
you and me, um, hopefully, will be among that firstborn male child who is going to rule and reign with Christ. God assumes that we know that there is a number of days that's associated with the birth of a male child. It's very clear in the Bible. There's always eight days associated with the birth of a male child. So if we're that male child who is the firstborn, who is going to be caught up to God and to his throne, we're going to be born, that is changed from mortal to immortal here on the earth on day one of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then on the eighth day, that's when we'll be caught up to God, we'll be raptured and brought into God's presence. The resurrection of the firstborn who are dead in Christ will happen at the same time over the same feast. So they're, the dead in Christ are in heaven. They're going to receive their immortal bodies in heaven because that's where uh, Paul tells us that God has their um, permanent homes reserved for them in heaven and they will receive their immortal bodies and then on the eighth day they will be glorified along with the rest of us. The sealing of the 144,000 happens over the Feast of Tabernacles as well. Every first fruits feast also has something to do with the giving of the Holy Spirit. The, the first fruits of the barley, um, the apostles received the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of the wheat, that's uh, the 120 plus 3,000 received the Holy Spirit. And here we have a seven-day feast. And we know that we have to pass the baton to that next group of believers. And we're going to pass it back to Israel again. And the 144,000 will be sealed over the Feast of Tabernacles. And we are going to be working with Christ to seal the 144,000 of Israel. Check out my Revelation chapter 7 uh, video on in my Revelation chapter by chapter series if you want to learn more about that. Then, after Jesus returns on the Day of Atonement, there will be another Feast of Tabernacles. And this is at the seventh trumpet. This is when the dead are resurrected. This is when um, those who are beheaded by the beast are going to be given their immortal bodies. It's when the dead are judged. And then on the eighth day, uh, the people who were beheaded by the beast who believed in Jesus will receive their glorified bodies on the eighth day. We also know that the Feast of Tabernacles will be celebrated every year during the millennium. This is sort of like their commemoration or an anniversary of when Jesus became or becomes king of the world. So there are some other eighth day events and there's more in that timeline spreadsheet. If you want to see all the things that happen on these various feast days, you can uh, check out that timeline spreadsheet. The Joel 2 outpouring on all flesh will take place on the eighth day. This is after we've been brought into heaven. We, be, we're, we show up as the 24 elders and then the Bible tells us that before Jesus takes the scroll, he's the lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And we know that before the great and terrible day of the Lord takes place, that the spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. We know that it's on the eighth day that the elders in heaven, just like Aaron in the uh, Old Testament, began his ministry on the eighth day. That's when we as believers, as priests to God, will also begin our ministry of intercession on the eighth day. And on the eighth day, uh, that's when the seal events will begin to take place. It's also when the trumpets, the first four trumpets, will uh, the events associated that will take place as well. And then the biggest eighth day, of course, will be after the millennium. And that's when we get to the day of God. And that is the new heavens and the new earth with the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride. That's when the bride of Christ appears. That's when the spirit and the bride invite people living on the new earth to come into the holy city, eat from the tree of life, drink from the water of life, and have fellowship with God and with them. 
All right, so those are some of the ways that I see the fall feasts of the Lord as being prophetic. And they have multiple fulfillments, and every fulfillment is a partial fulfillment. It's taking some aspect of that feast day and fulfilling that part of it. And so there are parts that pertain to Christ's first coming. There are some things that he, that's happening right now. And then there are parts of the fall feasts that are prophetic of the end times all the way up through the new heavens and the new earth. All right, so I have many, many videos where I talk about all of this stuff. There is nothing new in this video. It's mostly just a condensation <laughs> of all the things that I've been talking about for the last several years. So what about this year? What about 2023? What kinds of things will we expect to see if the rapture is in 2023? Well, that's going to be the subject of I think the next video that I do. So I hope that you will like this video. I hope you'll subscribe so that when that video comes up, you'll know about it right away because I think time is short. And uh, I hope you will share this video with other people. I know a lot of this information, while it may be kind of new to many Christians, I, I hope you will see that it's not far-fetched. All right, so till the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very, blessed day.